Another example of promising gene therapy involves muscular dystrophy. Muscular dystrophy is a genetic disorder characterized by insufficient production of a protein called dystrophin. Disease victims' muscles eventually weaken to the point where they cannot survive. Researchers studying dystrophy in rats have successfully used a harmless virus to transmit the missing gene to every muscle of the rat's body, reversing the muscle wasting that characterizes the disease. This is a magnified image of the quadriceps muscle of a normal mouse. The dystrophine protein is shown in green and outlines the cells in the muscle. This is a similar image of the mouse victimized by muscular dystrophy. And this remarkable image shows a muscle in that same mouse six weeks after the gene therapy. Protein therapy is similar, but instead of fixing a patient's genes, it is directed at artificially creating the correct form of the misshapen protein and injecting these correctly formed proteins directly into the patient. This may prove to be easier in the short term because we don't have to identify the specific genetic errors that cause the protein to be misshapen in the first place. We only have to supply the proteins that have the correct shape. Scientists have successfully produced a goat that has been genetically modified so that her milk contains a human protein that can be extracted and given to patients who cannot manufacture it themselves. But in addition to curing diseases, we are also developing the skills to choose which of our genes our children will receive. Greg and Marie are about to hear the results of their in vitro fertilization from their genetic counselor. They are about to face the full implications of this emergent technology. Your extracted eggs, Maria, have been genetically matched in vitro with Greg's sperm. Now, you've selected a boy with blue eyes, brown hair, and fair skin. As an adult, he'll be 5 feet, 11 inches tall, and his IQ will be near genius level. Now, I've taken the liberty of eliminating a few undesirable traits, alcoholism, cancer, Alzheimer's, baldness, obesity. Well, I thought, certainly no diseases, but... We were wondering if we shouldn't leave some characteristics to chance. You want to give your child the best possible start. Remember, this child is still you, simply the best of you. You could conceive naturally a thousand times and still never get such a result. I'll give you a minute to think about it. Should we choose the best that's in us for our children? If so, who should be involved in the definition of exactly what is meant by the best that is in us? If that scenario makes you uneasy, what about the next step? Computer, access my personal medical file. This woman is pregnant and is concerned about the features of her child. Project a holographic image of the baby. Now, extrapolate what the child will look like at 12 years old. Display the fetus's genome. Modify the following genetic sequences. Extrapolate what the child will look like with those genetic changes. If we give our children genes that we do not have, are they still our children? Save changes. Are there other scenarios that give you ethical dilemmas, Diana? Yes, there are several. Jeeves, please. 
My pleasure, Diana. Instead of selecting specific genes from each parent for our children, how about making identical copies of ourselves? Beans with identical genomes are called clones. Many plants naturally clone themselves in order to have offspring. Animal clones happen naturally as well. Identical twins have identical DNA and are natural clones. And now we can make a perfect copy of an adult animal. This is often a terrifically useful thing. Consider the goat mentioned earlier when we were talking about protein therapy. That goat could be cloned to form a flock of identical drug-making goats. In addition to fixing genes that are broken, and choosing genes for the optimum result of an offspring, and even manufacturing new genes, we can now mix genes across species. We have already explored mouse genes in potatoes, cow genes in soy and sugar cane, and even human genes in corn, potatoes, and rice. We have put firefly genes in tobacco, and even put jellyfish genes into mice so that they glow under UV light. A little imagination might lead to people with gills who can breathe underwater, or people with sonar like bats or dolphins. Is Superman right around the corner? There are more than 200 different types of cells in the human body. The precursor to all the cell types is called a stem cell. Stem cells can develop into almost every type of cell in the body. This means that they can be transplanted into a patient to replace tissue that has been damaged by an illness or an accident. Patients with spinal cord damage look forward to the day that stem cells can be used to form new nerve cells and repair their damaged spinal cords. Other patients from Alzheimer's to Parkinson's victims could also benefit from the development of this technology. Cloning and stem cell technology can be combined. Scientists have taken cells from a person who needs to be treated, insert its nucleus into an unfertilized human egg cell whose nucleus has been removed, and then let the egg divide into a mass of stem cells. This is called therapeutic cloning. These cells could be transplanted back into the patient without the risk of rejection, and there they can morph into the type of cell that the patient needs.